Hello, good evening. It's 4 p.m. here in Bangalore. Uh, a very warm welcome. In, in fact, quite a warm <laughs> February. Unusually warm February here in Bangalore. Uh, very happy to have you all with us today for a talk and Q&A session on urban commons. Urban commons for truly smart cities. My name is Raj Gopal. Uh, and I work with the admissions team at Azim Premji University. Um, we have Dr. Harini Nagendra to talk about what she calls the revolutionary potential uh, of urban commons. Uh, and they'll also answer any questions that you may have. We also have Seema Mandoli here with us to be part of the conversation. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Harini to you. Harini is Professor of Sustainability at the uh, School of Development, Azim Premji University. Uh, she also anchors the sustainability specialization, which we'll talk about in detail here at the university. Uh, she teaches ecology and development, which is a core course uh, in our MA development uh, program. She also teaches many elective courses, which are part of the sustainability uh, specialization, sustainability in planning and practice, land change and uh, sustainability, to name a, name a few. Uh, there's also research that she's doing here at the university, which we'll talk about in detail uh, in the talk. Uh, <coughs> she's also author of a forthcoming book. I mean, if I can uh, tell the uh, viewers, Nature in the City, the city being uh, Bengaluru. So Nature in the City, Bengaluru in the past, present, and future. April 2016, Harini, is that right? So uh, Seema, so let me take some time to introduce you to Seema Mandoli. Seema started her career in the corporate sector before she decided to uh, leave all that and uh, join work for NGOs uh, in, involved in the area of conversation, uh, sorry, conservation. Uh, it's focused on tribal rights in the Eastern Ghats. That's right. She then decided to do her MA development program at Azim Tenji University, uh, graduated in 2014, and is now working with the sustainability initiative here. Uh, at the university. Her ongoing project is a research anchored by Harini. And the same uh, topic of they're looking at the status of and changes to urban commons. So urban commons like uh, lakes, village forests, and uh, grazing lands. They're telling me before we started the conversation. And uh, in the urban and peri urban interfaces of uh, Bangalore. Right? That's it from me. I will uh, now request uh, I need to give a brief introduction. I can see some uh, questions coming in. Before we start answering those questions, uh, could you give a brief introduction, Harini, about uh, the topic? Right? And the people who are watching, uh, you're doing the right thing. You can ask questions in that ask a new question window. All right? And then click submit. We'll take it one by one. And if you experience any technical difficulty in terms of uh, a low audio, do type in. We have a pretty uh, efficient technical team working behind the scenes who will try to look into the things. Okay, I will go to you. So hello everyone and uh, thank you for dialing in on a uh, weekday evening at 4 o'clock. And uh, it's nice that there are so many of you interested in this concept of the urban commons. So let me begin. Raj Gopal gave you a bit of an introduction to the sustainability initiative at Azim Premji University. So before I start on the urban commons, since many of you might be interested in knowing more about our specializations, uh, what we do in the MA development program is in the first year there are four courses, but in the second year students can select among a range of specializations that we have on offer, or they can choose just not to do a specialization and have a regular master's in development uh, graduate with the regular masters in development. Uh, one of the specializations that we have is uh, a specialization of sustainability. And uh, last week's Google Hangout, you talked to another professor from the sustainability group, which is Manu Mathai, who's working on sustainable energy issues. I work, amongst other things, I also work on forest issues, but I also work on issues of sustainable urbanization. And that's part of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So we also have a great deal of research in the university going on on aspects of sustainable urbanization. And Seema Mudali also works with me on this. So what I'll do is describe to you some issues of the urban commons. And uh, then she can talk to you about some issues of the research that she's doing right now on uh, village forests of Bundutops in Bangalore. 
so i just let me start by giving you a little bit of a personal uh, anecdote of why i came to this issue of studying the urban farm and i've been studying the forest so my research work on forests in india started in 1993 when i just began my phd at the indian ministry of science right until about 2006 my research was largely focused on the forests of, of india of south asia and other parts of the world and uh, i'm also from bangalore and i realized sometime in 2006 that it was a bit ironic that i was doing all this research on forests that was situated in places far away from me while not looking at what is in my own backyard and that is sort of true around the world because we tend ecologists as a species of people tend to be focused largely on what's going on in the forest outside because forests seem more glamorous and exciting than cities and you don't tend to think of cities as having ecology and over the time as i started looking at bangalore uh with different eyes not of that as a resident but that of someone trying to observe the city and study the city so to speak you find that there's so much ecology in this city and in so many cities around the world and hence began this this long journey into urban ecology which is now at this stage culminated in the book that raj kapoor talked about which is nature in the city bangalore in the past present and future which will be out in april along this way i'd like some of you to think about i'm assuming many of you in do not all of you are uh, dialing in from cities across india but whether you're dialing in from a city or a more rural area or whether you grew up in a rural environment or in a city what were some of the formative or the most fun experiences you remember about your childhood of growing up of of being somewhere i'm assuming they had something to do with nature right. swinging under a tree in your grandparents backyard or you know playing near a lake or kicking a stone on a road that or playing with a seed pod or picking up these you know gulmohar uh, you can pick up these red things that you make into nails and you play with them you know so many things around nature your fundamental childhood experience around nature would not uh, of a fundamental experience of childhood or something that you remember with great joy would not typically be shopping in a mall or parking your car or spending time in traffic right it would be something to do with nature So nature is fundamental to us in many ways, and uh, the biologist E. O. Wilson calls this biophilia. He says that humans are evolutionary evolved to love nature, to be very fond of nature, and therefore it's not just that we need we want to have nature for practical issues like uh, keeping the climate in balance or keeping having clean water or having clean air. Of course, those are all extremely fundamental issues, but we are part of nature, and nature is part of us, and we must be nature to survive. Now, how does this change as we move into cities? India is on a path to rapid urbanization, and we all know that. And uh, while we might want to slow this down for various reasons or not, there's no questioning that we will get to become a more and more urbanized planet as time moves on, and a more and more urbanized country as time moves on. How do we make this more sustainable? Is there a way? Well, one way has to be that of getting more nature in cities. But if you look at the planning of smart cities, and that's why I brought this into the document, the planning of smart cities that we have, not just in India but across the world, seems to be largely focused on technology. Mm -hmm. Technology to solve all our problems of development, technologies to solve problems of inequity, problems of people not being, you know, well in good psychological states in city, in a in a city environment, the stress of living in a city, the pollution of a city, all of this technology is supposed to solve the challenges. Well, technology has its limitations. It can address some issues. It can't address a whole host of other issues. Nature seems to get left out of these discussions, and when it does, it gets addressed from a very again from the same technological sort of focus of like so. We need to clean up our water. Therefore, we need to plant more trees, or we need to have if people are stressed in cities, they need places for recreation. Let's give them more parks. And yes, these are very important areas. but that's not all that nature gives you mm-hmm. if you look at the way the myriad ways in which nature serves you in a city serves human right and of course it does many things apart from serve human being right nature is important in and of itself but in a city apart from supporting biodiversity there are many things that human beings use mm-hmm. and gain from and some of these are public uses some of these are what i call urban commons uses and some of these are private uses so let's try and look at these the kinds of public goods that you get from nature are things that are available to everyone so clean air trees help to clean air the kind of water that you purify 
recreational services that they provide to people in the city. These are all public services. These are services to the city at large, right? Now there are other services which are private services. So the well, which are largely for the wealthy, the people who can afford, you know, large gardens or access to good parks or live next to a clean lake or have clean surroundings. That's when you have, you might have your own home garden, things that you grow from, or a, a, a apartment. You have these new apartments these days that advertise with them on private lakes, <laughs> private butterfly gardens, terrace gardens, and so on. So that's the private aspect of it. But there's something in between this perspective of public nature and private nature. There's what we often get left out of the discussion, and that's the whole focus today. It's on the urban commons, what you call a common pool resource, something that serves the needs of the community living in that area, which is really a local, but it's not a private use, nor is it the city at large. Mm -hmm. And when you start, we've started doing these studies, we find an astounding number of people using commons in in Bangalore in so many ways so for instance let's take a lake what all do you find around the lake you find typically within the lake you will have some grazing so you, you know at the edges of the lake you have people coming with cows with goats so there's grazing going on yeah and that grazing is not just benefiting them that grazing is really organic grazing because it's not sprayed so we get organic milk that serves the city because the city buys its milk it also closes the loop because your carbon footprints of the the distance and you know this these milk miles, so to speak, that they travel is very little because you can have grazing within the city. You get fishing within the city, and that supports the protein needs of the people who live around the city. We find if you talk to people, the women around these lakes, and typically these are low-income neighborhoods, many of them traditional villages that got swallowed in by the city, otherwise, they could be slums that are with migrant workers. Typically, their nutritional requirements are very large, but the proportion to which they can't afford to really buy greens on the market, for instance, or buy fish on the market. But you can collect greens from the sides of the lakes. So what we find is when in dry seasons, especially when the lake bed recedes, your water might be lower and therefore you don't have so much water to grow vegetables in your own backyard, perhaps. But on the other hand, since the water level recedes, you get a lot more greens growing on the lake and you can collect them to use to supplement the needs of the household. Let's take the other areas around the lake. So there's village forest that Seema will talk about, these gundatops, from which you collected fodder, you collected fuel wood, mm -hmm. you know, so varieties of other things. These kinds of spaces serve needs, even street trees. So if I remember growing up in Bangalore, you would find migrant workers in the morning that would be passing by to take branches off trees and cook. Right, from, right. Right? Or if my, so my mother had a neem tree that she was trying to grow, just in our compound close to the gate. Never worked because people would come and try to that. But if you think of it, that one neem tree was probably providing leaves to serve Absolutely. so many people who pass by the Those kinds of uses are getting excluded. So when you have these commons being removed from mm. the, the space of what people can use, the community can use, yeah. Yeah. who is this community? Typically, this community is the less well off in the city, mm. and the people who are the most dependent, they need water to wash their clothes, they might need a place to graze their cattle, they might need some place to get food or fuel wood or you know, medicinal plants for a small use to serve. So, for instance, if you look at slums, uh, people who have small holes and coughs rarely go to the doctor because you can't afford to. So, your natural resilience is held by these kinds of small medicinal plants that you have in community spaces. And therefore, the urban commons is extremely important for the resilience of the poor in the city, especially the most well, vulnerable yeah, in the city. Yeah, yeah. But this doesn't find place in any urban plan, not just in India, but if you look at cities across the world, mm -hmm. they rarely talk about nature to begin with. But when they do talk about nature, they talk about private provisioning of nature. So you must have nature in these private spaces and have uh, public private investments and you know corporate parks, maybe where you plant trees. Or you have public nature, which is street trees and areas like mm -hmm. that, or lakes that are recreational spaces that are gated. But this idea of the nature of the commons, which people can actually Fantastic. use, you know, multicultural, that's what you need to have. So I was talking to Seema slightly before we started. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly when what comes into my mind is recreational purpose, yeah. parks and playing right, around. Right. But you're taking, you're, you're looking at slightly differently from how it's going to help the people uh, living on the country. Yeah. Not to say recreation is not important, but yeah. that kind of answers. I think the first question that uh, the person is asking is: Will our future city, smart cities, be able to survive amidst the existing social inequalities? 
So, uh, which is a very good question. Which is, which is, which is uh, just selecting that uh, yeah. question first uh, from Uman, Uman Srivastava asked. Okay. Which you were trying to answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the prevalent model of smart cities, I would say no, those are probably going to exacerbate our social inequalities because mm -hmm. they're smart. If you look at a recent formulation from the Ministry of Urban Development website that Seema sent me recently, mm -hmm. it said smart cities are for smart people. Mm -hmm. and the, and the definition there of smart people becomes uh, fairly mm -hmm. sinister because smart people are those who know how to access smart technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does that do for all, you know, the, the huge numbers of people who don't have access to technology who cannot use it in the in the way that they can actually mm -hmm. be smart. This is really going to exacerbate inequality. And which is why I'm saying for a truly a smart city in a real, in a true meaningful use of the word smart would be something that 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 reduces inequality, that increases well-being, that increases social connection mm -hmm. and a community mm -hmm. feeling amongst mm -hmm. people. And that is not something that, uh, I mean, that that's where you need community spaces and sure. nature is a great sure. place for the world. But Seema, I was thinking it would be nice if you could tell them a little bit about your work on Gundatops, which is this, again, it seems to be something that is common not just to Bangalore cities across across India that have these village forests, but we don't think about them at all in urban plan. Please. So, if that when you are doing, uh, see, I would like to request because you have done MA development as to MG University. I can see customers coming and asking how uh, how is it that he's done is using fishery science. Okay. Right? How is this going to help? Uh, maybe you can tell from your experience as well. Yeah. Thank so you. as uh, when Rajgopal introduced, he mentioned that I had started my uh, career in a corporate sector. So I've come a long way from a corporate to now to a fully uh, from an NGO to now a research base. So. Uh, I had worked in a rural and urban background largely and I was looking at uh, what I could do to sort of complement and strengthen the experiences that I had and that's when I came across the MA development program, a friend had mentioned the course and um, by looking at it I was excited by looking at the syllabus and the program and this was, I was in the second batch but even after joining I was not entirely sure what it would offer me after working for eight years, I was like what can what can, the, what can the course offer me that I don't already know about? Mm -hmm. Just being a bit pretentious. But well within the, I think after the second semester of doing the uh, uh, course, where in the first year we have four courses on ecology, sociology, politics and power, um, it became clear that, you know, the, the kind of perspective mm -hmm. that I had in my previous work was like, you know, almost blinded, a That's single good. lens. So if I worked on gender and mining, I looked at it in terms of impacts of mining on women. Mm -hmm. But by doing a course in ecology, a core course in uh, economics, mm -hmm. in politics, in power, yeah, I was able to system. look at the same issue from multiple mm -hmm. lenses. And what I found is that it didn't make the problem simpler. It mm -hmm. made the problem very complex. But in many ways, it was also clearer. <laughs> I mean, there was a better idea of uh, what I was doing. And the exciting part of the MA development program was the field components that we had. We have a field immersion, then a six-week internship, and an eight-week internship. So it gives you the opportunity of uh, testing or examining what you had learned in class immediately into the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, another advantage is that you get to choose your area of interest. There's nobody telling you you can work on it. So my interest was ecology and environment, and I wanted to do something in the related to the environment. And now I knew in an urban context. So that's when I uh, wrote to Harini and. Uh, uh, I started working on her project on lakes and wood tokus, which are which are forest lakes, the, lakes in the periphery yeah, of uh, but all, and also what you mentioned the forest blooms wood so um, so I did my six week and the eight week internship both in the on wood okay. uh, partly on wood in the six week but mainly in my entire winter was in. so it's a good fourteen weeks to work on a particular research topic. And uh, so these slopes are found in, uh, earlier they would have been found in the center of the city, but as the city developed, and this is from the times of Tifu onwards, uh, they now largely found in the periphery of uh, Bangalore. Mm -hmm. They were planted by local communities for meeting their needs of wood and fuel. Mm -hmm. And so they were multi-use. They would, the fruits for mangoes were used for consumption. There were some jamuns that were sold by the poorer people. Then the wood was used for construction in uh, village development works, race to raise money for village works. Grazers use them as fodder, we used to cut for fodder or uh, for grazing and nomadic communities use the site as a shelter. So there were a whole lot of services that the people were using from this source. And this was very exciting if you found in, in the six week and eight week. Okay. And this all happened during that time. And it helped to have somebody who was able to you know guide you through the process of looking at not just 
Okay, data collection is one aspect of it. You go and you can, I can do 65 yeah. interviews and collect a lot of data. No, but what do I do with this data? How do I connect the dots mm -hmm. with the data? So uh, that's the kind of faculty support also that the university provides and the mentor support that they provide. Then you can always approach somebody who has uh, who's work in the area. And, and what, uh, uh, while working those two interns, normally uh, when, I, when you choose a, something you want to work on, you're lucky if you get to work on one interesting thing. So many times people often can do only use it as do it as a hobby or they just let it go. But for me, I was I realized during this process that I was working on e ecology, which was an area of interest. I'm I've done a commerce degree, so <laughs> to move to ecology, <laughs> it's only this kind of a, uh, program that would have allowed me to really work. On. And then uh, I found that the, the issues of social uh, justice and equity, mm -hmm. those are also something that is a core value of the university and mm -hmm. something that I'm also interested in. And tangentially history. I realize that Harani has a lot of his interest in historical, uh, you know, historical mm -hmm. transformations. I had done history in 10th standard and I never knew how to use it. You read non-fiction and fiction, <laughs> but you never really know what to do with the history. So for me, that, that combination of three different things that I like to do was has been Completely fascinating, and I think that began with the winter internship, summer internship, and it has continued That's now right. as a part of this. Perfect, perfect. That probably answers why uh, uh, your interest in uh, this space, about how you, I mean, working with Harini on this project. Thanks, thanks for <laughs> that. So Ajit, uh, that's a uh, very broad question. What are the prospects in MBA development after doing uh, this program? You could choose to work in any of the allied areas of development. It could be sustainability, health and nutrition. Uh, law and governments, there are plenty. So, hope that answers your question. Uh, let me pick the next question. I don't know in which order uh, it came in. So, this I'll select this. They're asking by urban common, do you mean spaces that are created, maintained, and monitored by the government? Can you please give us an example? Uh, okay. select that. Sure. So the question is uh, Sonia, Sonia's question. Yeah, by Sonia saying by urban commons, do you mean spaces that are created, maintained, and monitored by the government? And can you please give us an example? So in the city, everything is maintained by the government. So I think that's sort of a given default. Uh, I mean, at least in it. now, but is it created by the government? Not necessary. So lakes, for instance, in Bangalore have been created by local communities and some of them date back as far back as fourth or fifth century. And uh, so definitely not, you know, so and in many natural spaces. Some parks would have been, so many city parks would have been created by the government. It depends on the uh, particular areas. What I'm trying to say with the fact that they're commons is that they're common pool resources of value to the community and therefore often, not always, but often are monitored by the community in sense. So rather than the government stepping in, it's the local community. So traditionally, that was the way it was. It was a common pool resource, but it was also what is called a common property regime, which meant that the local community living around that place had rules for how much you could harvest, when you could harvest, uh, what you could access, uh, how many people could visit. Maybe one family once a year, for instance, could cut some wood, or during certain seasons, you had uh, there were sacred uh, uh, spirits in the groves, uh, so you couldn't use it. For whatever given reason, but there were certain colors, there were certain rules. It was maintained and monitored by the community. When the, what we find with buying of this, especially if you look at the very early areas, once it passed out of the ambit of the community, of the panchayat, of the local village, to the habit of the community, that hugely impacts the government. Because certainly, instead of being, if we have a problem with what's going on, so let's say it's degrading or somebody's not following the rules, you don't have to go to your village office anymore. You have to go all the way to the city office and they pass you from one office to another. He doesn't know your village, has no interest in maintaining it, and you get the short strip. You, know, you don't know how to deal with these people in their offices. You can't read the documents. And this really makes a difference because they may be able to monitor it, but how can they actually enforce any of the rules that they used to have? Mm -hmm. So this transformation to the city government, once it land, land actually moves from the local government to the city government, it actually often tends to become far more degraded. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, if you look at the city of yeah. Bangalore, you see the city is expanding. And swallowing and up all these commons. All these commons right. Right. Thank you. I think uh, Sonia has a follow-up question here. I don't know whether uh, it could be part of our conversation. She's asking, and the origin and origin of the concept of smart city. 
That's quite a broad question. Now. That is a broad question. I'll have to take you much more deep into the history of this. But largely, let's say that so it's it's largely a, a fairly recent concept that was not or didn't originate in India. It originated in the Western world, which is looking at corporates, so try partnership between corporates and government to try and use technology for making cities what they call smart. Mm -hmm. As in, you know, how much water do you use? How much electricity do you? How do you balance your uh, transportation needs, getting all of this wired and interconnected? So that's the basic idea. Right. Somebody says she just joined the discussion. Some good points so far. Thank you, Ansika. So if you have whatever you missed, I think you should be able to catch up that as a as, as a review. Uh, Rakesh's question. I'm not sure that my question is within the framework of the topic. Uh, he's talking about 24/7 drinking water. One of the facility or luxury that the smart city offering is 24/7 drinking water. In the Indian context, the water is scarce. Scarce. Do we really need 24/7? Do you really need? Do can we afford? Is the question probably uh, water? Uh, That's a good question. I don't think. So the more you have of a resource, the more wasteful you need to be of it. So I guess that's uh, his basic point, right, Rakesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, if you have 24 by 7 water, you would tend to waste it and be much more. Uh, the other thing with water is always water, and I think I'm not sure if Manu mentioned this last week. Water always has a, what you call an embodied energetic cost. Mm -hmm. How do you get water to your house? So most cities in India and across the world get piped water, not only from rivers that are really far away, mm -hmm. but also often over elevation variants. So if you think of Bangalore, the water is pumped from a low height to a very height and a very high height and then release down to all our underground sumps and then pop up again to come down to our pipes. So all of this is just, it's not just the 24-hour uh, water supply, but for that we need 24-hour electricity and then a lot of things are changing. So yeah, I really think we need better ways to think about this. And we need to think about recycling water, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if you could think of cities trying to recycle their water, it's just pumping out huge quantities of wastewater, that would be more sustainable. And there was one article uh, about this water purifier that we have, mm. what, what we see in people installing at homes. The, the water that's gone in as waste yes, it's, is huge. It's and if you're not uh, using it for any other purposes, it's, it, it gets that's a, that's a, The next question is <laughs> city model is more suitable for Indian conditions. I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, Ajit, Ajit, you have to. Uh, reframe and ask us in much more in detail uh, what you meant by a city model. And otherwise, question is what, what is the right model? Uh, so, the, but for I think you answered that previously. I think uh, something that's more inclusive and something that is more bottom up and participatory, definitely. But if I don't know what Ajit's question is referring to, there can be models of governance, models of uh, mm -hmm. construction. So, for instance, one of the models of city planning is should you have a uh, densification or should you have extensification? That is, should you have uh, you know, multi high rise buildings and lots of people living close together, or should you try and spread it out? And that's a mod that's a debate that is still running across the world, so we don't really have any clear cut answers. But if you're looking at governance models, I would say at least definitely for the Indian context, means something much more broad about it. Let's go back to the research that you were talking about uh, previously, uh, and you said. Uh, we're talking about um, trying to understand what are the theoretical frameworks that you use in your research uh, that you're doing. Could you just explain? It's not just data collection. You said you collected data and did not know what to do with the data. Yeah, it could be just individual points on a sheet of paper, correct, but not really. Correct, correct, correct. So, uh, at least the research that we are doing is uh, more problem oriented. We see a particular problem here, in this case, caused by the impacts of urbanization, mm -hmm. changes in institutions as a result of urbanization on uh, urban common good resources. So within keeping that as the central, uh, we are trying to frame it using some uh, frameworks which are, for example, resilience. So as resilience. Well, resilience, yeah. So what is the social and ecological resilience? How is uh, how is the social and ecological resilience um, effective mm -hmm. when common pool resources are degraded or converted? So we're trying to look at it in terms of uh, how is the ecology or the biodiversity affected? How is uh, something like supporting services or other services that the commons would have provided a change? How is it uh, that uh, you know the the dependency in terms of food fodder that she was talking about? How is that getting affected? Mm -hmm. Which leads us to another uh, framework that we're using, which is that of ecosystem services. Mm 
Right. So there are there is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which has spoken about four uh, ecosystem services, which is what the tangible and intangible benefits that we humans derive from uh, ecosystems. It can be a lake, it can be a forest. Mm -hmm. So the, it includes the provisioning, cultural supporting, regulating services. So we are trying to place at least our research in mm -hmm. those uh, frameworks for now. But we are more focused on trying to see if, if, if the research has to speak beyond. An academic or That's a great. theoretical thing. Yeah. So, can well, what is it that we can take beyond the <laughs> just a mere uh, paper or a journal publication? You mean to say, in terms of even coming up with solutions? If we have tried. I mean, we're not saying we have, but yes, definitely outreach. How can the research reach out to okay. a more number of people? So, theoretical frameworks are important, uh, but we're also seeing it as uh, how can we address it as a problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways in which we are trying to do this has been the systematic focus on outreach because I think especially in cities, people have such a role to play in putting the pressure on the government. One way is to suggest to the government, you know, change this policy X and Y way. And you know, you can suggest often till you are blue in the face, but it's not necessarily that they are waiting for the, this ideal solution or they think your solution is ideal. But what we found equally effective or maybe more effective in many cases is to try and talk to people and Get this broader discussion okay. with public okay. space going around. Okay. I think the uh, lake just outside is that is that a good example? Kaikondra Lake. Lake is a very nice example. Of, uh, the community came together, yes. and I was reading the, some inscription. People I didn't know there. Like. So there's a lake which is very close to the uh, one of the university locations on Sajapur, Kaikondra Lake. And for those of you who are on uh, video, I mean, or looking at YouTube, you should look at the video of the community of action to restore that particular lake, which is a very good example of a new type of urban commons of people coming together to restore the lake. So Thank you. I think uh, there are a lot of questions coming in. I'm not sure if you're taking the right order, but uh, we will definitely try to answer uh, all the questions. Uh, this is something which I, I also was want to, wanting to ask you, Harini and uh, Seema. Uh, what is the understanding of the urban governments from an Indian context. Or do they do planners? You said it's not there, it's not an Indian problem overall, but what's your sense? Do they do we really understand the importance of urban governments here? Is there any work that is happening? So if you look at the commons in India broadly, there's been a lot of scholarship on commons in rural areas across different parts of India. Okay. Of course, across the world. Elena Rostrom in uh, 2009 got the Nobel Prize uh, in Economics for her work on the commons to show that, I mean, so that really showcased the importance of the commons, I think, for the wider uh, mm -hmm. policy community internationally. And in India, for a very long time, we've had a very good scholarship on the rural commons. In the urban commons, it's been much more limited. Really, in urban areas to begin with, I think scholarship in several areas of looking at Ecology broadly, you know, whether it's classical work on community ecology or population ecology or more social ecological, what we call social ecological systems work, like the issues of the urban commons have been very poor. Having said that, recently we've been looking at uh, trying to get networks of people together. So there was a conference recently, the Indian Society for Ecological Economics, where we had an entire panel on the urban commons. And we got together people working on urban commons issues from uh, Bombay, from Gurgaon, from Pune. And there are also groups that we're slowly trying to bring together to form a pan Indian network. So there's some very interesting work going on across India in different places. Oh, and some action work also. So there are many communities that are actually practicing urban commons work. So, for instance, Surat has some very active communities. Uh, there are other parts of the, of the country. Chennai has some very interesting groups, Kolmatur, which are working on these kinds of issues. To uh, is, is it to develop new common spaces or is it to yes. preserve existing ones? Uh, to restore yeah. and maintain places. Restore and maintain. So things like degraded lakes, for instance, would be a very good example. Yeah. So hope that answers your question, Raja or Nair. Yes, there's a lot of work happening. I'll probably take that question along with what Ajit is asking. That uh, people were discussing about adapt, ad adapting some systems from Barcelona. Maybe do we need to do that? Or I think we think have knowledge. In the country, <laughs> what is interesting? So, if you look at the, what a lot of these uh, places like Barcelona or Madrid or uh, different cities, Bogota, for instance, would be a very good example, mm -hmm. have been doing with the urban commons is this work of restoration and acting. So, the city, uh, it's what you call policy interest or multi level governance, which is important. So, it's see, a community by itself can only do so much because mm -hmm. it doesn't have the power of enforcement or legal authority like within the city. 
So it can take care of its part, but if someone comes in to encroach on the park or to do something which they would not like, how, how, where is their legal part of it? Mm -hmm. So the city and the, on the other hand, the city is not going to have enough capacity to monitor all the parks or monitor all the lakes or look at the challenges. So this needs to be done in close protection. So if you look at, there is a very interesting uh, examples from the Latin American cities, so that's a good question, Ajit. And uh, if you look at some of these spaces, I was recently reading about examples where, for instance, the city worked with the local, so local community said we want to restore a park, which is going to be taken away for some private space. Now the city helped them restore the park. Once the park actually got restored, what happens is in a high crime area, that actually becomes a network for people to meet and socialize. And uh, so, you know, women start sitting next to each other in these uh, parks and then they start growing community gardens to feed their children. Then it turns out to be a high crime area where drugs are dead, but there's, there's a network of women, they make sure that the drug dealers are not close to the park. Over time, this locality transforms just by the availability of this space. And, uh, for instance, if you look at Kaikondili Lake here, and uh, recently I was trying to write up something on the community restoration of the lake. If you talk to the groups around, Many of them say that the presence of the lake was an incentive for them to work on solid waste management, to work on uh, issues related to the government schools and their uh, you know, strength and teacher uh, training there, or to work issue on issues of traffic management. Just having a space for the community to meet every day and, and you know you get to know your neighbors which you don't in an anonymous city. Interesting. That's interesting. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I'll probably take the next question. Oh, I think we have, did, we have answered this uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Mohammed, uh, uh, how, how will the smart city project affect the urban poor? I think they're talking about not in the, they're talking about the smart city. The concept. Uh, the Maybe concept, Sima will have to see the uh, something on the smart yeah. city. So what we're seeing in the documents which are talking about smart cities, it's always about uh, clean, neat, safe cities. And uh, there is uh, there is a tough mention of of course uh, equality and uh, you know access yeah. access to all. But uh, clearly, it, it uh, if the there is a community of poor who are dependent on natural resources in the city, mm -hmm. and your uh, document or whatever is the model for the smart cities is not talking about uh, how these spaces are going to be preserved, but are only mention them as recreational spaces. Then I don't think that the smart city is really looking at what it can do for the poor, mm -hmm. because the models that they talk about are actually going to be alienating uh, the poor. One one of the things is that they say that the funding for smart cities, for example, has to come from public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. And there is a paper that has been done here on the lakes, with Arni and the lake, uh, which clearly shows that four lakes were public, which were given for public-private partnerships. Traditional users were completely uh, denied access to it. So the you idea access. access to the lake. So they could not use it for grazing. They could mm -hmm. not use it for fishing. They were converted into parks where you have boating or retreats or restaurants. Mm -hmm. And we need to pay to get it. So yeah. you have to pay to get it. Obviously, you're not going to do traditional. Then there are these home guards that patrol, uh, for example, the lake. So this vision of a lake with its paved paths has has mm -hmm. no place for a grazer or a fishing. Mm -hmm. so, so we can't say that. Can, we, can you even call it a common space? No, not very really common space. space. Mm -hmm. And clearly not for. Uh, Poor if you're smart and you know internet, maybe you can make it, but I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me take it in some order. I think I'll go on. This is something probably we are working on. Are we accounting for ecosystem services when, when forest land? Forest land uh, Nayantara, I'll take your question uh, the next. So Nayantara's question is, are we accounting for ecosystem services when forest land is cleared to expand cities? And no, of course we're not. So the effect of... So when we're saying, can we make cities sustainable, in a way that's a bit of an oxymoron and uh, because the city can never be more sustainable than uh, the forest land that it replaces or the fertile agricultural land that it replaces or the wetland that it replaces, right? So that, that's not going to be the But can, given that, and that's why I was saying that we can work to slow down urbanization and make that more sustainable and there are many people doing that. But given that India and the world seem to be on this path towards urbanization. I don't think we can reverse this in the next, uh, whatever, at least the short term. And uh, therefore, if we're thinking of how to make urbanization more sustainable, then we have to think about how we can restore nature or protect whatever nature is left in cities. There's no way around it that creating a city is going to destroy ecosystem services. Thank you. I'll take the bottom. Uh, this is a question asked by 
Rabindranath Bhandar. Criteria to divide cities on on rural and urban. Uh, so Rabindranath uh, has this question of what criteria do you use to divide cities based on urban and rural? And different categories, different criteria are used. India has a very simple definition of uh, population size that really separates small towns from so this grade A, B, C cities. Mm -hmm. It's all for its population mm -hmm. size based. Some uh, countries do it based on population density. Some uh, countries do it on the you know, the physical size of the city, the administrative unit. So there are multiple ways. But in India, it's done by population size. Now there's the peri-urban so, also now that has come. Yes, yes. there's rural, urban, and a peri-urban. Which is where we are doing most of the research work. And like in the city of Bangalore, it could be areas like that border the BBMP boundary oh. with the Gram Panchayat. So you have like a BBMP and a Gram Panchayat just next to each other. So, so the peri-urban yeah. is this uh, fringe around the city, which is just, mm -hmm. which is um, not urban in classification, maybe, but uh, urban in character in many ways. Processes that happen there. So uh, we answer this question. I'll take it quickly. Rather was asking why this name uh, urban common because there is something called rural uh, yeah. commons as well. We answer this question. We yes. join in late. So this question is rather question is why this name urban common? Is it, is this only for urban areas? Right. And yes, because there are commons outside the uh, outside the, uh, in rural areas, which the value is strongly recognized even in our Indian policy document. But the value of urban commons or the fact that there is a functioning urban commons that are used so much and it's so many millions of people in cities depend upon is not something that is really very well recognized in policy or even just in general daily life. But in terms of equity and access, you equity. see there could be more problem in the urban uh, commons than rural commons. Can we say that? Is much that more. Much yes. more. Urban commons are far more challenging area just because of the people around it keep changing and the numbers of people are so many. And even now, when you say commons, people mostly think of it as rural. So mm. it's kind of you have to stress the urban commons more, mm. maybe to bring the focus to the. Thank you. Uh, let's take the next one from Neha. Neha is asking, how does the jurisdiction power of local governments comply with the integration of the urban commons? Mm. Uh, so let's take Bangalore as an example, Neha, that, that, and I think that's a, so as a, we were saying, if you're looking at the peri urban spaces, often what we do is we set up paired comparisons. You might have a village in the Gram Panchayat area just outside the city, and another village which we're looking at in terms of how it manages its commons. It might be similar size, similar uh, you know, urban development around it, but it follows falls within the BBM. And then if you ask people, for instance, so let's, let's say there are a couple of years of drought and families are not getting water. And you want, uh, you know, maybe the panchayat to make some provisions for you. Even if there is a power hierarchy within the village and there's a caste hierarchy in the village, you can still have some social pressure that you can play on, put on your uh, panchayat representatives to say that I'm not getting water and I haven't been for two, three years, and do something. You know, get me some tankers free or uh, clean up this lake or do some other kinds of provisions for that. But if you ask them what happens when they come within the BBAP, they say in a year or two everything changes and our life has become much worse now mm -hmm. because. You go to one office, they send you to the next office. The next office, they send you to the third. The same lake, maybe BBMP holds the power, to, um, the has the jurisdiction of the lake. The BWSSB has the jurisdiction of the sewage lines outside the lake. The Lake Development Authority can tell you what to do to maintain other parts of the lake. And there is the Revenue Department, which looks at the uh, stormwater drains outside the lake. So you get bounced around from department to department. People don't know who you are, and the documents are in a language often that you can't read. The officials may not be very sympathetic. So yeah, the the lack of local self government really makes a big creates a big challenge. Now, what activist groups in the city have been pushing for for a very long time, and so has the court, is to say that therefore you need what you call ward sabhas and local area sabhas, which would help greatly, but they have not been implemented in the spirit in which the court called for this and the activist groups called for this. What they said was, if you have an elected representative for a ward, let's say a Mahadevpura, which is our local ward, is huge. Mm -hmm. The number of people inside this is, I mean, Bangalore is a city of 10 million, Mahadevpura has, uh, you know, tens of uh, lakhs of people. So how do you then deal with managing this? One corporator, one MLA is not going to be able to handle this. So then you need area sabhas and within that you need uh, so you need a ward sabha and you need an area sabha where you have people from that community who can then be part of this. There are ways to create local self-government within cities and we haven't done enough of it. Thank you. 
just reading the next question, I think it's slightly, uh, it's not talking, asking, talking about urban yeah. commons here. You may have to put in your sustainability uh, specialization hat here. Uh, I mean, just I just first like to thank everyone for sending in questions. We have such a vibrant discussion. We are yeah, yeah. unable to keep pace with the questions. <laughs> Very nice. So yes. please keep sending uh, in your questions. If you if you want to ask question, I can see a couple of viewers. You have to type in the ask a new question window. Ask a new question window. It can be anything. So I'm just uh, repeating what I usually tell when I go in colleges. There is nothing called the wrong question. Yeah. Yeah. We have to be really careful about our answers. <laughs> so. Keep keep typing in. Uh, yes, and we learn a lot from your questions. So keep true, sending true, them true. in. So I'll just select this. I think she's. Uh, this is Hansika saying. He's asking about. Uh, ecosystem of sustainable uh, consumption and production. So like, can you just take the example of the lakes that you were talking about previously? Mm -hmm. Maybe she she joined in late. Uh, your research is talking about. Uh, People using lakes for not only for recreation but for maybe you want to repeat the thing in your findings, uh, Seema. Yeah, so uh, what we have found in the research that we're doing in Bangalore is that normally a city, a park, or a lake is seen as more of a recreation or an aesthetic purpose. Mm -hmm. But the people we have been talking to who use the lakes, there's, there are many different kinds of users. We have grazers who come and uh, graze their cattle. Uh, they come and cut grass as fodder because if they don't have the source, then they have to buy uh, mm. buy that. Mm. So they have to invest money into it. They cost more. Then uh, watering their their livestock. If uh, Bangalore is being increasingly uh, water scarce, and we keep talking to grazers and they are constantly saying that we are having to buy water in tankers, which mm. is an expense. Again, they can't really mm. afford to have. Their profit margins are going down. Fishing was traditionally done by local communities, people who wanted uh, to uh, supplement their diet with fish or protein, they mm -hmm. could just go and fish in the lake. And they tell stories about how these women, especially pregnant women, liked a particular variety of indigenous variety of fish, which was had a very high calcium content, which they used to fish from the mm -hmm. lake. But now uh, the fish, uh, the whole lake is given as a tender to a particular individual who bids okay. for the tender. So they can only uh, fish in the lake. And they stock it with exotic food. Exactly. Yeah. So indigenous varieties are almost lost. Like mm -hmm. we were just today uh, in Balandu Lake, and there are only large catfish which nobody really consumes. They're mm -hmm. eaten up all. They're the only ones that can survive in that sewage water, and they have eaten up all the other. So uh, then there is daily domestic use of the lake that was there. For children swimming uh, in the lake, or women coming to wash their clothes, household uh, mm -hmm. uh, the vessels. Uh, or using it for bathing, water for bathing. Mm -hmm. So all these multiple uses are, I think she's asking about maker centric, you know, mm -hmm. this is like, these were uses that they could actually get from a lake in their backyard. Absolutely. The food, the yeah. fodder, the yeah. fish. Yeah. Yeah. But now they have none of these access to any of it. And along with it, uh, there is something very cultural also which they are losing because of this change in the uh, relationship with the day. So, for example, sorry, they have sorry. regular pujas when the water overflows. Yeah, yeah. There used to be agriculture. Yeah. There was a lot of agriculture yeah. that used to happen in the day. Sugar cane, uh, ginger, rice, ragi, all this was grown in the wetland of the day. That's completely discontinued. So, all, so that has affected the grazers because the stubble from the uh, paddy used to be fed to the cows as fodder. Oh, right. So that okay. change is that also uh, broken. So all these users, if we're talking about make maker centric, then this user centric, it was that single lake that they could have used for so many things, mm -hmm. is now completely lost because they don't have uh, the lake is degraded or the top is cut down and converted to some other kind of so the uh, but the thing we need to do probably and some lake crews have started doing this in uh, Bangalore is to reinvent that idea of maker centric and how do you transform it? You're not going to probably go back to that mm. situation where you had uh, you know just the village with this, right? But for instance, one of the things that Kaikondili Lake or other lake groups are thinking of, uh, there are uh, so let's say you have sewage, mm. you can harvest actually the sewage uh, nutrients from that because what happens is water weeds grow on this nutrient enriched mm. water. So uh, an organization, in a, uh, which is an NGO which has been working on this elsewhere is suggesting that you can create these rafts which are made from old plastic bottles that you tie together uh -huh. along with a little solar engine. Okay. So what it does is basically aerates the raft and this nutrients collect weeds and the weeds and reeds that grow you can then because it's a floating raft. Uh -huh. It also creates oxygen for the fish in the air. So fish survive under that. 
Now, if you pull that back and you get the reads, what they're trying to now figure out is can you actually tie up with other organizations like industry, for instance, which make take these reads and make maps for urban audiences. Mm -hmm. And then you can maybe train local communities of you know, so women who live near the lake or something like that in terms of groups to actually use these reads. So a lake becomes a productive space where people can earn some livelihoods. So I think we need to think more creatively about these and see how we can do this kind of local yeah. change. Because so, it will change, I mean, the surroundings will change, and there's going to be a lot of different kinds of development. But how can you yeah. still make it a useful resource for people? So, we have a. Uh, Hansika, hopefully, that answers your question. You can still type in if you have more. Uh, we have 10 more minutes to go. Yes. Uh, uh, but I had a question that I want to ask. It's a personal question that I was, I was thinking. But if, um, as a citizen, if I find some lake being polluted near my home, I know this. I think it's called. Uh, Hospalaya Lake or Somsunda okay. Palaya. And what what can I do you know, to protect, to, to contribute individually to the protection of that lake or the environment? Is that any, any, any suggestion? So, first thing is to go gather a group of people. Okay. Because like uh, I heard you were telling the lake group. Yes. Right. So, okay. there are always lake. So, across at least these places, there's so much work to be done that it exhausts one person. and of, after some time, it gets depressing if things don't move and the things are, have their own time and inertia. <laughs> so what helps is to gather a group of like-minded people. And what often happens is even as things progress and they progress fairly slowly, you each, each other keeps the motivation going. Mm -hmm. And then you find you have other things to do. Maybe you then start working on waste management or traffic issues or, or whatever else you know interest to do. But typically, so what, what we've seen groups doing across the city already. So somebody gets interested in this lake. Mm -hmm. And then sends a mail out or starts talking to people in that area and saying who else is interested. And then a small group forms. Then you start finding out to begin with it. So in a city like Bangalore, I was telling you about the jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. You don't know who owns the lake, so to speak. Mm -hmm. who, who's in charge of restoring it? Okay. So that process can take you months. I know groups that have been, you know, it took them a year or two years to find out how to department. Mm -hmm. Just to find out who is in charge of their lake, whom do they go to to demand us. And then the process of, of basically chasing people down, so saying, you know, sitting in their office every day, talking to this person, getting the media to cover issues, talking to other constituencies to create a larger community group, mm -hmm. to start maybe, so if there's things like a trash cleanup day, then you know, all of you who work as a community and clean up the trash, maybe there's a planting day and you all bring trees and you plant and then you water okay. them. So you find other ways to take care of it in the short term and then try and get over some government action to clean up the lake and to stop whatever is happening. Maybe maybe trash is being done or if someone is constructing an apartment. I think there is a lake group and probably but it, to me it sounds like a full-time job. <laughs> Everyone who's doing it has their own full time jobs and so, so the kind of energy people put out this is at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this uh, Another question from Ajit Raj. Uh, Seema, I think we discussed uh, this briefly. He's asking about challenges mm -hmm. posed by migrants coming into the metros from rural background. Probably they were the ones who were using those common spaces. You were telling quite a bit. Quite For them, uh, they don't have, say, a fuel source to cook mm -hmm. their meals or heat the uh, water for their daily needs. So they depend a lot on the fuel wood they can collect from commons like the thorps or mm -hmm. around the mm -hmm. Some of them even use the water from the lake, even though it may be polluted. But since they don't have they don't have access to the village tap as much, there's a lot of conflict where the villagers might say, uh, during times of scarcity, especially the conflict es escalates. So they say you can't use the water from the village. So then they have to dig these holes in the uh, lake bed and collect water for their personal purposes. And yes, in Bangalore. It, you almost see a small hutment uh, settlement of people living in these blue plastic shelters close to the lakes. And they depend on the lakes for their washing and their, their multiple uh, mm -hmm. needs. Mm -hmm. And because of the booming construction industry, they really have no other place to go to. Right. And even right. even uh, you, they sometimes are forced to use these commons as a public toilet because they are not provided, the construction companies have not provided them with mm -hmm. any alternate facility. So migrants are. Uh, uh, they, they do struggle a lot and sometimes the commons do help them a lot. Yeah. So I, I, I don't necessarily look at it as a uh, challenge. Uh, they're not posing challenge. I think we need them as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we depend them. on them to build our cities. Yeah. But, uh, so I think the challenge really is in the fact that the real estate uh, 
industry needs to step up to do its bit to contribute to cities and not just profit from cities. You see, you know, so many of these real estate developers selling lakefront properties next to polluted lakes, but not contributing at all to the maintenance of the lake or to do anything else. So. Right, good. So, uh, before we close, quick questions on, on, on the research. Uh, this is a question that I also get asked when I interact with youngsters who want to join the social sector, to, or what people who want to do our master's program as to the importance of research in social sector. We want to quickly talk about. Uh, well, I think Hani can add, but uh, what I found is that I came to the research, social research skills. I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I, as I mentioned, I worked in the social sector before, and we've done something called as action research, which okay. is basically we have a problem and we do a fact finding mission and identify what are the causes of the problem. But then it becomes very anecdotal and local. Mm -hmm. What a research skill really helped, at least me, to do mm -hmm. would be to make the connection from whether is it really truly a local problem? Is the urbanization of Bangalore uh, or the deterioration of a lake because of a just what is happening around it, or is it linked to say the IPPL and the liberalization that happened in the Bangalore head scene? Mm -hmm. So to make these connections, because you you can't you to do advocacy or to do any kind of uh, social uh, change if, when you're in the sector, you have to have a macro picture as well. You can do um, field related advocacy and fight on the field, which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. But you also need to look at what right. is the larger uh, picture. What are the entire consequences of a particular problem uh, instead of just addressing it piecemeal like a band aid. Uh, Thank you. That probably answers the importance of courses like introduction to research, advanced social research, and exactly. all that. Yeah, we and have the research skills. Uh, and I'll say this research skills, it's also not just about collecting data, it's mm -hmm. about writing, it's about thinking, it's mm -hmm. about perspectives that you can have about a particular uh, problem. People are going to challenge your research. How mm -hmm. do you defend mm -hmm. it or fail defending it? Mm -hmm. Either way, both are learning. In fact, one of the things we find that consistently in placements is that uh, the student, you know, employers nowadays want to see results of their project, independent projects. So mm -hmm. they do students do an eight-week independent project. So what have we done? And the project need not be a research project; it could be an action project. As she said, any action also requires some research, some thinking through. A journalist, a good journalistic account also requires research. True. So and how do you know? As she said, it's not just your personal perception, but something that is uh, a bit larger than that. It's, it's evidence based. Uh, evidence based, and that's something that I think organizations are increasingly doing. Absolutely. I think there's the last question. We'll take this uh, question. Uh, Sony asking whether shouldn't we focus more on developing rural areas? By taking account of the needs of the, the community. of the community, is it more sustainable? Is, uh, is, is Definitely, we should not ignore our rural areas. I think in the search for city uh, urban development, and uh, if if that is happening and that is happening to some extent, that that would be very sad. Mm -hmm. So I think there are initiatives across India by the government, by the civil sector, and by local communities themselves to create more sustainable local areas. So if you look at uh, areas, for instance, organic farming or handicraft initiatives. And so one good place, uh, especially Sonia, if you're interested in this, is this organization called, or this, uh, this community effort called Vikal Sangam, which is trying to look at areas of community rejuvenation across India, and a lot of them mostly are rural. There are a few cases there or which are urban, but they're largely rural, where you can have, so these efforts help greatly in terms of reducing the huge levels of migration and uh, things like that. But I don't think it's either or. I think at the same time, we need to make sure that our cities are safe homes for all the migrant labor that goes in mm. and the people who already live there. I don't think we can say emphasize one over the other. We need to take care of our cities as well as our people. I think it's a continuation question. We answered that uh, what is with this emphasis, is there going to be a lot of migration happening from the rural to urban because of the smart city thing is uh, because of the smart city. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, you know, um, I think emphasizing uh, smart cities yeah. will increase migration towards the cities. I'm not so sure. I think the migration is happening because of larger macroeconomic policies, the construction industry boom, issues like uh, you know degradation of these rural environments with too much oh. mining and drought and a lot of other issues. So. So Raghav, uh, to answer your question, uh, I will probably get uh, Sujit Sinha next time. He's asking, isn't this what Gandhiji said? Uh, so we have Sujit Sinha yeah. who uh, takes a course on Gandhi and tackles. Uh, so. uh, 
just self reliant protects environment creates community sense of well being Yes, 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 yes definitely. Much, so, uh, we just crossed five o'clock. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Seema and Harini. It was a wonderful to have you. Thank you all watching us. Thank you to the audience. Very, very vibrant set of questions. Uh, thanks to the team working behind the scenes to yes. set up all those uh, things. If you need to contact us, please email us at uh, admissions at apu.edu.in. That's admissions at apu.edu.in. Uh, because Indian University is both on uh, Facebook and Twitter. So if you want to get updates on our programs and uh, such uh, events, we'll be back again with themes around uh, education, development, policy, and governance. Uh, until then, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.